Mr Speaker, anyone who heard my speech in the third reading of the Waikato Tainui Raupatu Sediment Bill will not be surprised that the ACT Party stands opposed to this, the successor to that divisive bill. And it is not, I have to say, a very pleasant position to be in, uh, the only party in the House opposing such a measure, which no doubt has the uh, utter support of all of those in the gallery. It's notable listening to the, most, to the speeches that have gone before, Mr Speaker. In our view, both National and the Green have been speaking, Greens have been speaking in code. The National Party has talked about co-governance, partnership, sharing. What they really mean is granting iwi a right of veto over activities that they don't approve of. The Greens co-leader has talked at length, but as usual not explicitly, about sources of pollution, permitted activities. What he's actually intending or should be saying is that the Green Party seeks to make farming the lifeblood and backbone of our economy an activity that farmers will have to apply for a consent for. That was what all that stuff about nitrates and sulphates and sediments actually meant. Phosphates, Phosphates thank you. <laughs> Mr Speaker, it's Maori Language Week, as we all know, and so I'll do my best with this one. Heiwi tahi tato. That's a phrase that one will find uh, not said in this House this week. It means, of course, we are one people and is what Governor Hobson said to each signatory of the treaty. The bill before us, added as its predecessor, violates this fundamental pr treaty principle. It establishes a precedent wherein the Crown and Maori leadership elite divide New Zealand's key assets amongst themselves. And for what? Is it a treaty settlement? Well, page two of the bill says, quote, the deeds between the Crown and Ngāti Tuwharitoa and Raukawa do not settle Treaty of Waitangi claims of Ngāti Tuwharitoa or Raukawa relating to the Waikato River, close quote. So I guess it's not a settlement. The treaty process as it pertains to the region's Waikato Tainui people was settled in 1946. The Crown agreed in that year to pay an annual sum of £6,000 for 50 years and then £5,000 every year after that in recompense for the uh, confiscation, the wrongful confiscation of lands in the 1860s. That's two or three million dollars every year in today's money. As Michael King wrote of the final settlement negotiations in Ngāra in 1946, the Waikato Tainui leadership was so pleased at this offer, they jumped and accepted before the Prime Minister could change his mind. History has shown, however, that it was Waikato Tainui that changed theirs. By the 1990s, they were angling for a better deal, and in 1995, they signed another full and final settlement with the then government. This one specifically excluded the Waikato River issue till some future date making a complete mockery once again of that full and final tagline because, Mr Speaker, of course, you can only have one full and final settlement. Once you have a second full and final settlement, you open the line for a 20-second and a 30-second full and final settlement. And uh, Mr Harawira, Mr Speaker, has said kāpai, kāpai, and Mrs Turi is agreeing. So Hansard should record that the Maori Party is acknowledging in this House that we have no full and final settlement, that they will never end. Mrs Turi is laughing. She thinks it's funny that the grievances will go on forever and that there will keep on being these pathetic, misguided attempts at settlement because they're never going to end. This bill will further enshrine in law the concept of us and them, a far cry from the one people vision the Treaty intended. I realise the intention of many is to have a us and them working together in a shared vision and strategy. Many in this House feel that way. I am sure also, in fact I would say for sure, many Māori feel a special bond with the Waikato River. It is naive, however, not to think that there are those who look at the river and see dollar signs. 
Let us not pretend otherwise. In any group, there are those who seek advantage, any advantage they can find. This bill and the concept of co-governance provides those sort of people with limitless opportunities. This is a threat we will face multiple times when this bill comes into effect. My notes say if and when, but Mr Speaker, we all know it's when. I want to ask a question that transcends even that. At what point can us New Zealanders, New Zealanders like me, born here, my father born here, when, we, when will we be allowed to claim a special relationship with the land as Māori do? Will it take another 100 years, longer, or perhaps never? The last is how many Māori leaders see things. While most Māori get on with the business of living, many in their so-called leadership continued to play the we were here first card. Their leaders, or those leaders I should say, claim that they have a relationship with the land and rivers that the rest of us will never ever have. No matter what we do, we will never have that same connection, so they say. Thus we end up in a situation where five iwi, allegedly representing about 66,000 people, wind up controlling the nation's longest river. I'm aware the bill talks of co-governance, but the reality will in fact be very different, Mr Speaker. I'd be a little surprised if all of those grunting and, and making uh, sighing noises from the other side have actually read all the bill, but some aspects, some extracts from the explanatory note are alarming. You only need to go that far. For example, quote, persons carrying out duties under sections 12 to 14 must recognise and provide for iwi environmental plans. Recognise and provide, what does that mean? Further on, the bill's allow, bill allows iwi to recommend to the Minister of Fisheries bylaws to prohibit fishing, which, quote, will be made unless the Minister considers that an undue effect on fishing would result, close quote. Mr Speaker, this bill is not about working together. It is about gifting to iwi, some iwi, considerable veto power over any activity they disapprove of. The bill is full of such examples. There is nowhere near enough time to go through all of them but they each carry serious legal and social consequences. The message to be taken away from this bill is that whatever individual person's attachment to the river may be, its significance, the significance of their attachment, will be judged by iwi leaders who have already determined their relationship to be forever more special because they were here first. And I see Mrs Turia agreeing. She's agreeing. They're special because they were here first. This bill is typical of the government's approach to race relations, piecemeal and short-sighted. We saw it in Peter Sharples' covert mission to the UN to sign the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. And Mr Harawira thinks, as do most people with any sense, that that, uh, far from being an aspirational document with little effect, will have profound effect on this country. And Mrs Turia says that's great. Just as Sir Geoffrey Palmer saw no problems in referring to undefined treaty principles in our law, National sees no risk in signing us up to a declaration that requires us to fund a separate Maori government. If you doubt it, go and read it. The fact of the matter, Mr Speaker, is that co-governance is a farce, and anyone who has read the bill cannot fail to reach that same conclusion. The concept seems noble and low risk, but like the mistakes of the past and those National are planning to make in the near future, it will further divide and hurt us as a nation. Mr Speaker, the social, economic and legal quagmires we're heading for will be the next generation's problem. The treaty settlement process we are still involved in 25 years after Geoffrey Palmer said uh, the famous words of Section 9 of the Sadown Enterprises Act will pale into comparison, pale into insignificance to what our children have coming to them. The ACT Party opposes this bill. Thank you.